Well, we'd like to uh, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, a second uh, ASIO CTSNet uh, webinar. Uh, I'm uh, Mark Slaughter, uh, the uh, editor in chief of the uh, ASIO Journal. In conjunction with uh, CTSNet, uh, we have started a, a series of uh, webinars uh, uh, due to the rapidly changing uh, landscape uh, and uh, new technology, as well as what are sort of emerging areas of interest. Uh, for uh, uh, most uh, uh, clinicians, programs, and uh, some researchers as well uh, around the country. Uh, we have a, a great uh, program again today, and I, I'd like to just quickly uh, introduce our moderators, and I will turn it over to them uh, so that we have plenty of time for presentations and discussion. Uh, so today is a part of our uh, series uh, uh, Dr. Adam Protos, who's the uh, Section Chief of Adult Cardiac Surgery at the University of Mississippi, uh, is our uh, uh, co-moderator. Uh, our digital moderators, uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar, also from the University of Mississippi. And today we've added our special co-moderator, uh, Dr. Claudia Smarr from the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Marr is a professor of clinical medicine and cardiac surgery and the medical director of the Mechanical Surgery Support Program. So at this point, I'd just like to welcome everybody. Uh, please submit your uh, questions to the chat room. Uh, we have an ongoing digital moderator, and we'll try and include as many of them as we can. Uh, Dr. Protos. Thanks, Dr. Slaughter. Um, yeah, we're very excited about uh, continuing this uh, webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about improving outcomes in cardiogenic shock. We've invited some of uh, uh, the foremost experts nationally and internationally to discuss the topic with us. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll get started and introduce our panelists for today. Uh, first off, we have Dr. Dan Burkhoff. Um, Dr. Burkhoff is currently uh, the Director of Heart Failure, Hemodynamics, and Circulatory Support at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. He's also an Associate Professor at Columbia University and is known nationally and internationally for his work in heart failure physiology, remodeling, monitoring, and support. Welcome, Dr. Burkhoff. Thanks Next, very much. Happy to have you. Next, we have Dr. Naveen Kapur. Dr. Kapur is an interventionalist and advanced heart failure cardiologist at Tufts, Tufts University in Boston, where he serves as uh, associate professor. He is also the director of uh, acute circulatory support and the associate director of the cardiac catheterization laboratory. He also serves as the director of the Cardiovascular Center for Research and Innovation uh, at Tufts. In addition to his clinical expertise focusing on interventional therapies for advanced heart failure, uh, he is also nationally recognized for his work with the American College of Cardiology, the Heart Failure Society of America, and the Society for Cardiac Angiography and Intervention. Welcome, Dr. Kapoor. Yeah, thanks very much. Finally, we have Dr. Lior Yarbrough. Dr. Yarbrough is currently a practicing cardiac surgeon at the University of Virginia, where she holds the title of associate professor and serves as the chief of adult cardiac surgery. Uh, in addition to the director of the heart uh, transplantation and mechanical circulatory support programs, she is nationally recognized for her expertise in the surgical treatment of heart failure. Welcome, Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you very much. So happy to have everybody here. I think we're really going to have uh, an informative and fun uh, discussion today. Um, our brief agenda uh, for the webinar uh, will be starting uh, with Dr. Burkhoff uh, and his discussion of cardiogenic shock staging, uh, risk stratification, and invasive hemodynamic monitoring, followed by cath lab devices for cardiogenic shock, um, and uh, then surgical options for shock with Dr. Yarborough. Uh, so uh, we're going to try and hold the webinar as close as we can to an hour. So we'll just kick things off and get started. Throughout the webinar, we're going to be having uh, audience participation polls. We really are interested in what the practice is out there at different centers in, in the United States and the rest of the world. So please participate and uh, remember to submit your questions to our digital moderator, um, Dr. Jaya Kumar, who will be running the chat box and submitting the questions uh, uh, for us from that forum. So with that, let's get started with our first poll. Um, you'll have about 45 seconds to respond, and then uh, we'll use that as a platform to launch into Dr. Burkhoff's talk. 
So uh, this poll talks about uh, different strategies for uh, hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, we wanted specifically to know what the practice is um, out at uh, nationally and internationally at different centers. So pulmonary artery catheters are used for hemodynamic monitoring in patients with cardiogenic shock at my institution, always, often, rarely, or never. I think this is going to be a great uh, kind of platform to launch into your talk, Dr. Burkhoff, because um, one of the things that strikes me about the management of cardiogenic shock is that uh, there really is a wide variance in practice, um, yep. and that's, that, that's part of the impetus for this webinar. So um, with that, we can see the results of the poll are in. 24% um, of, res of uh, respondents said, I'm sorry, 32% of respondents said, uh, they always use uh, pulmonary artery catheters in uh, hemodynamic monitoring for cardiogenic shock. 52% say often, 13% say rarely, and 3% say never. So with that, uh, Dr. Burkhoff, uh, please take it away. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks for including me in this, uh, in this exciting webinar. So I'm going to talk about cardiogenic shock staging, risk stratification, and the use of invasive hemodynamic monitoring. And uh, these are uh, disclosure. And um, these are, are highly, uh, these topics are highly interrelated, but they are discrete entities. Staging, when I think of staging, I think of a kind of a qualitative measure of disease severity. When I think of risk stratification, I'm thinking more of quantitative indexes that assign a probability of a, a specific clinical outcome. And hemodynamic monitoring, monitoring it basically has a role in, um, in hemodynamic uh, risk stratification but also, um, we, there's been, as I'll, as I'll review, there's been evidence that the use of hemodynamic monitoring can improve outcomes. And I think it'll be interesting future research to understand why that is. So in terms of staging, I think everyone is probably now very familiar with the sky stages, A through E. And the, over here, this, this gives very simple qualitative definitions of uh, what the sky stages are, starting from at risk, beginning shock, classic shock, deteriorating, and extremis. And on the right here, you see that um, hospital mortality uh, correlates and and um, and worsens as the as the state as the severity of the of the patient um, increases. And that's I mean it's it's quite obvious. But this uh, the, the availability of this staging system has really um, caught on quite um, internationally and um, has really been a, a boost to the field in a way. But it's it's more I think that we can probably do better than this, and I think we'll be seeing some modifications of the sky stage is coming out very soon from sky. And uh, one thing that has been done in the cardiogenic shock working group um, that's led by Dr. Kapoor, who we'll hear from in a little while, is, is looking a little bit beyond the qualitative stuff, looking at, for example, the number of devices that a patient gets and crossing that also with the number of drugs that a patient gets. And what you can see here, this is sky stage B, C is in the lighter uh, color, in, in the dark, slightly darker color, bright red is stage D, and um, in dark um, uh, maroon there is stage E. And as you can see, as you get to stage E, you go from, from, from B to E, you, you, you start adding on more drugs and more, and more devices. And also you can also layer on that, what is the patient's lactate? So also add a, a dimension of, uh, of um, hypoperfusion to the index. So here you see now kind of a cardiogenic shock working group modified staging system. And you can see here that the mortality, uh, also we can look at not only mortality, but also native heart survival and also the need for the cardiac replacement, either an LVAD or an urgent uh, heart transplant. So you can see with this modified staging system, we have a little bit more uh, discrete, uh, a little bit more um, granularity in what the outcomes are as the stages go from B, B to E. So what about risk stratification? So we recently uh, did a, a very extensive survey of the history of risk stratification. It really starts in the early 80s with the Killip system and proceeds in kind of three uh, uh, epochs. One is the medical management for STEMI when, when all we had was medical management. Then we had the primary PCI era. And then more recently, 
what's been added since 2010 is more contemporary devices with devices like the Impella device, Tandem Heart, and, and really the explosion of ECMO. And you can see over the decades, there have been a huge number of these, um, of these uh, uh, risk scores that have been developed. And this shows the, um, the frequency of which different components are used in these scores. For example, what you see in the top 10 are things like age, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, creatinine, heart failure, whether it's AMI or cardiogenic shock, mental status, renal insufficiency, liver function tests, et cetera. So what we looked at were what were the most frequent, frequently used uh, components of these, uh, of these risk scores. And this is really, uh, is really what we found. And they are a combination of patient factors, hemodynamic factors, and, and biomarkers. So the way that many of these risk scores work is that they have different components. This is the IABP2 shock score. They have different components and you get different points for uh, whether or not the patient satisfies the, the specific criteria. And then based on the points, you have um, a different uh, projected mortality over the first 30 days of, um, of uh, following the, uh, uh, the, the initiation of cardiogenic shock. Now, um, I just showed, th this is three of the most recent um, scores, the card shock score, the IBP2 shock score, and the ANOVA score. And you can see that there's only two parameters that are really common to these, which are age and lactate. Uh, but for the most part, these, uh, these scores really contain very different, uh, different, different components. And the interesting thing, and, and maybe the unfortunate thing, is that um, uh, the, the performance of these scores are relatively similar. This shows uh, five different scores and, and shows the ROC curves. And basically they're very, very close to each other and actually not that good. Uh, we're, we're talking about sensitivities and specificities of around 70% um, uh, for, for these various scores. So, and this is a, a recent study that was uh, based on a real world population of patients with shock uh, the existing scores had modic, modest prognostic accuracy with no clear superior score. Most recently, um, there has been a lot of interest in biomarkers. Uh, this very recent study that was published from Germany looked at 58 candidate markers and used what's called the lasso regression to find out which scores, which of these parameters, uh, components uh, contributed uh, mostly to the, uh, the outcome of, of mortality. And they wound up with four components, lactate, interleukin-6, nt bro BMP, and cystatin C. So looking at hypoperfusion, uh, inflammatory response, fluid overload, and renal function. And basically, again, they showed here that there were, there were, if, uh, there were three tertiles that they looked at, and the mortality was markedly different uh, based on these, um, on these four components. And what you see here is this, uh, this score was called the CLIP score which is shown in black and the CLIP score on its own performed better than some of these, than all of basically all of these other hemodynamic scores that we, um, that we kind of mentioned before and addition of a score, for example, the IABP2 shock score to the CLIP score, which is shown in green really did not improve the uh, predictive, um, predictive ability. So where do hemodynamics kind of fall into this? Um, well, there's been a lot of controversy, and as we saw from the poll, about whether or not to use hemodynamic monitoring. And a lot of that controversy came from the ESCAPE trial that was performed in the early 2000s. The ESCAPE trial showed that patients with acute decompensated heart failure fared worse if they had a PAC, a pulmonary artery catheter, than if they were just managed medically by clinical judgment. But the key thing to recognize is that the ESCAPE trial did not include, it actually excluded patients with cardiogenic shock and also patients on inotropes and patients who the physician themselves thought would benefit from a PAC. So the, the study was completely not relevant to the, to, the, um, to the population of patients with cardiogenic shock. What you see at the bottom here, this is now the trends of PAC use and also the mortality over time of patients who got or, or who did not get a PAC. At the blue, you have the, uh, um, the, um, uh, the heart failure, decompensated heart failure. And what you can see, just like in the um, in the ESCAPE trial, patients who got a PAC tended to have a higher mortality. However, at the top is the cardiogenic shock. And what we see past around two, 2007, we see this trend that patients who got a PAC in cardiogenic shock had better outcomes than patients who were not managed with a PAC. And this was recently confirmed in a very, um, in a very recent study that came out, I think it was one, one or two weeks ago, 
which showed the use of PAC was associated with reductions in death, stroke, and readmissions for heart failure, uh, and also a marked increase in the number of patients who went on to have heart transplant and LVAD, obviously indicating that this was a very uh, sick, sick population. So we have evidence that, that PAC use, uh, retrospective evidence that PAC use can uh, improve, uh, is associated with, uh, with, with uh, better outcomes. And a similar finding was obtained, a little bit more granularity with, from the cardiogenic shock working group. And here, what we did was we look at PAC use is, um, and classified patients from around 2000 uh, registry patients. Either they had no, they did not use PAC at all, they had incomplete assessments or they had complete assessments. And what you can see is around 40% of patients had complete assessments, around 40% had incomplete, and about 20% had no assessment of, cardio, of, uh, of hemodynamics. And at the bottom here, you see the, the mortality as a function of the degree of hemodynamic monitoring. And what you can see is that the greater the number of, of, of the greater, the, the more completeness of the monitoring, the lower was the mortality, especially in stages D and, and E. In addition to staging, um, and just, just kind of looking at uh, using uh, PAC as a index, um, we also can, you can also use PAC to, to stratify based on other, on specific parameters. And in this plot, we show what we refer to as the congestion profile. What we do is we plot the right atrial pressure versus the wedge pressure, and we divide this plane into four regions, a uvolemic, a left-sided congestion, a right-sided congestion, and a biventricular congestion. And what you can see is that most patients, 50%, uh, present with bilateral congestion, elevated wedge and CVP. And um, about 24% present with left-sided congestion alone. A smaller percentage present with right-sided congestion. And only about 20% are kind of in this euvolemic state. And why is this important? Because this shows us that, um, this graph shows that the, uh, the uh, congestion profile has a big impact on mortality. Here we have, um, you see if you're in a euvolemic or a left-sided congestion profile, that your mortality is about half that if you have uh, elevated central venous pressure. And that was true whether or not your cardiogenic shock was due to myocardial infarction, as you see here in green, or whether it was due to heart failure uh, decompensation, as you see in blue. The other thing that we see here is that for a given profile, the uh, mortality in heart failure seems to be a little bit less than it is in MI. And that reminds us that while most of the, the information we have about shock is from AMI, that this, this whole population of heart failure, um, the physiology of the patient with decompensated heart failure may be different and may, um, may benefit from different strategies of monitoring and, um, and, uh, and, and risk stratification. Now, another thing that's coming up and very important is the use of machine learning to further help to, modify, uh, to risk stratify and understand, um, understand uh, prognosis. And this is, again, is, is data from the cardiogenic shock working group. This looked at 28 hemodynamic and metabolic patterns, uh, parameters. And this is a plot that kind of clusters the patients into how close they are together with regard to these 28 parameters. And uh, basically in the analysis that identified three main clusters, and this is another way of looking at these 28 parameters that are what are called radar plots. And it's very easy to understand once you get a hang of this, but you see each patient is, uh, each group, the averages are plotted uh, compared to the dotted line here, which is the average, uh, the average or the normal value. So if you're in, inside the, the uh, ring, you have a lower value. Or if you're outside of the ring, you have a high value. And you can see that there's distinctly different hemodynamic and metabolic um, uh, character, characteristics of these three clusters. And again, these clusters, looking at the, at the hemodynamics and metabolics, we uh, kind of refer to these patients in the first cluster as non-congested. These are kind of euvolemic and not a lot of, of uh, end organ dysfunction. They have a lower mortality than as you go to patients who have evidence of cardiorenal, um, more, more, more severe hemodynamic derangements and evidence of renal dysfunction. And then, and then uh, worse yet is cardiometabolic, where you've got evidence of cardiac hypoperfusion, liver, kidney, et cetera, dysfunction. So I've gone through a lot of material very quickly, but I think staging, the sky stage uh, with modifications is performing very well for us understanding kind of qualitatively and, and as a 
as a, uh, a lexicon for us to communicate about how sick patients are. In terms of risk gratifications, uh, we have a, a, lot of, a lot of them available. They don't seem to all perform, none of them really seem to perform uh, extremely well. Um, and I think it's a big question is whether or not there is a need that we continue to develop um, scores that are more sensitive and more specific. For sure, more sensitive and specific scores would be very helpful in clinical trials so that we make sure that we're in including and, and stratifying patients based on similar degrees of severity. Um, in addition, more specific scores could help to guide more appropriate and rapid initiation of invasive treatments. And also one thing that's been discussed is, is there a need for a futility score? That is, is there, is there a index that you can guarantee that a patient will not benefit from therapy so that we could save resources and spare um, uh, the uh, pain and suffering? Um, with regard to hemodynamic monitoring, it's not standard of care throughout the US as we saw in the poll. It's, it is, has been associated with better outcomes in retrospective analyses. We do not know yet how it is that the use of PAC um, improves, is, why, why is, is it associated with better clinical outcomes? And for that reason, prospective studies are in development. Thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge the, um, the Executive Steering Committee of the Cardiogenic Shock Working Group, who has contributed an immense amount to uh, the data that I've shown. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great um, presentation, Dan. Adam, you're on mute. Adam, you're you're muted. Can you, is it better now? Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can hear you now. We can hear Sorry you now. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Burkhoff. You know, uh, Dr. Marr, I'll, I'll let you kind of fire away with the first question since this is really part of your uh, wheelhouse and um, we can take it from there. Yeah. So, you know, we want to open this up for discussion. We would like to, for this to be interactive. So please submit your questions in the chat box. But to kick us off, then, we have, at least in the US, a quite cohesive system of care for things like STEMI, and STEMI outcomes have improved quite a bit. Now, one would argue that cardiogenic shock outcomes are much worse than STEMI, but say, unlike trauma, where there is a hub and spoke model and tiers of centers ranging from level three to level one trauma centers, why can we not arrive with the recognition, the awareness, and a system of care for cardiogenic shock that is as cohesive as these other two entities? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know the, the history of the evolution of those, but you know, the cardiology community is extremely data-driven. And as we where we're, where we're sitting now, we lack prospective clinical trials for for any of these things. I mean, there's been really beautiful papers about hub and spoke. And in fact, one of the reasons for generating the sky system was that there could be rapid um, identification of, of how sick a patient is so that they might bypass a, a, a spoke hospital and or be transferred very quickly to a hub. Um, so all of these concepts are, are out there right now. Um, but I think that the cardiology community and maybe even the healthcare systems are gonna, are gonna require some proof uh, in, in terms of data that, that it improves outcomes, that maybe that, that um, the economics of it are feasible. And um, I think that is, is really what we, what we um, in the research community have to really focus on is generating that data. You know, it seems though that for, for the other two examples, STEMI care and trauma care, um, that data really didn't exist prior to implementation. Somebody just basically said, if you have an MI, you need an EKG within a certain amount of time frame, and then you need to be triaged and sooner is better. And the, the trauma surgical system, as I understand it, stemmed from military experiences, also not really evidence-driven. 
you know, so I, at some point we're just going to have to come to grips with the fact that this remains an area in which our outcomes leave yeah. a lot to be desired. Our stratification is imperfect. We have no consensus as evidenced by our audience poll around what those parameters look like, right? So it just it just seems we, we think, we're not making progress. Yeah, I think I think there is some progress. I mean, look at at what Bill O'Neill has done with the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative, um, which which really is a um, you know testing or applying a algor an algorithm for shock um, that, you know, these it's voluntary, uh, many sites have voluntarily, uh, you know, signed up and are following a protocol. They're scattered throughout the United States. I think that that uh, he has almost a hundred sites that have kind of bought on. Um, they've been publishing their data retrospective, you know, not, not randomized data. And, you know, I think that, you know, they're, they're reporting outcomes that are, you know, in the range of 70% or plus. And, um, 70% uh, survival and greater um, uh, based on, you know, the use of PAC and, and withdrawing inotrope support, switching inotropes for, for, uh, for mechanical circulatory support. Um, and the data are, are, you know, there's still, there's a lot of criticism of the data because it's not prospective randomized. Um, so we don't know for sure whether or not, you know, these, uh, this algorithm, uh, uh, you know, really truly, uh, can across the board yield a 70% survival, which would in fact represent a major advance. Yeah. So, so you know, why aren't why doesn't everyone buy into it? I don't know the answer to that. Dr. Slaughter has and his Dr. virtual hand up. Yeah, did I, you have a question, Dr. Slaughter? So uh, uh, always being somewhat the cynic, I, I think part of the issue though is even in the sky system, which has been extremely helpful in the first step. But you know it says hypotension and tachycardia, but the answer is there's no number. So for trauma, the idea is of blood pressure less than 100, you know, a heart rate greater than 100, but there's very clear cut uh, issues. And I say we frequently get called to see someone that's been in the hospital for two or three days with a blood pressure of 90, a heart rate of 120. And you say they don't have a pulmonary artery catheter. It turns out their index is 1.5. So the, I think part of the problem is that the definitions though are a little subjective and therefore it's hard to sort of mandate or suggest, you know, definite referral patterns unless you have more objective data. But I'd be interested in what you think. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, I, I'm not sure, I mean, this the again, the sky staging system is kind of semi-quantitative or qualitative. Uh, on purpose, I, I believe, because it's meant to be rapidly um, deployable, rapidly applicable, without waiting for um, without waiting for blood tests and and things like that. But I think it's only when we get to be more quantitative and use of of risk scores, shall we say, that um, um, you know that, that I think we can start approaching this. And I I really think that they are better scores are required for clinical trials. Um, because, um, you know, we can't be randomizing patients um, unless we kind of know that they're of equal kind of disease, really of equal disease severity on a, on a, on a quantitative basis in, in respect to multiple, multiple parameters. So I think, our, I think the goals have to be clinical trials to move the field forward. And I think that we need better tools for, for risk stratification. You know, I was pretty surprised in your, um slides, Dr. Burkhoff, to see that a full 58% of patients in cardiogenic shock either had incomplete or no monitoring um, at all, um, which kind of raises questions about how are therapeutic decisions um, really being made. And um, the other thing that I wanted to ask is, uh, you know, we saw in several of your slides the utility of lactate um, in predicting mortality in these patients, but that's a uh, pretty sensitive, but not very specific um, marker. And you kind of alluded to other biomarkers as well in your talk. Um, clinically, do you have any advice for combining lactemia with other biomarkers or um, indicators? Because obviously, as these patients progress through this, the sky stages, uh, their mortality becomes abysmal. So yeah. I'd be interested to hear your take on that. 
Yeah, I think, look, lactate is, is a very easy index to measure. And I think especially at the, um, at the uh, spoke hospitals, like if you're deciding about whether or not you wanna keep a patient um, or transfer a patient, if, if, you know, depending on if you have more advanced uh, forms of mechanical support, lactate is kind of a good and quick, quick thing to, to, to look at. Um, if you're not clearing your lactate, um, if, you're sta you know, if you're either stable or, or getting worse, that's really a sign that, that you know, the shock state is getting worse and you should think about either advancing the form of treatment or transferring the patient to a center that has, uh, that has more advanced, uh, advanced therapies. Um, I did show the data from uh, Holger Thiel's group that showed the CLIP score, which is based on four parameters. That was, you know, out of, um, I think it was 50, 58 potential biomarkers. Um, those four, you know, came in. It was, it was inflammation, uh, lactate, renal function, and um, I forgot the fourth one, but there were, you know, basically four, um, you know, four, um, uh, four markers that, um, you know, that together give a, you know, a pretty good uh, indicator of, of how sick the patients are. Okay, and, well, and as I show that, that performed as well as the, as the, all the other clinical risk scores that we have, basically. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, obviously, early identification of these patients is crucial. Um, we, could, we could spend a lot more time on this, but um, uh, just because of the constraints of time, we are going to move on to our next uh, panelist in our next poll, actually. Um, if we could cue that up now, that would be great. Um, the next poll is um, generally the first go-to device at my institution for cath lab patients in cardiogenic shock secondary to acute myocardial infarction is intraortic balloon pump, ECMO, Impella, or other devices. Um, please take the time to um, respond and participate. I think it's a, a um, great launching pad for further discussion. Um, and uh, while you're doing that, um, I'll introduce uh, our next talk, which is going to be by Dr. Uh, Naveen Kapoor. Uh, he's going to talk to us about cath lab devices for acute myocardial infarction and heart failure. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Kapoor, the, the, um, much like uh, the variability we saw in the first poll, I'm expecting uh, there to be quite a bit in the in the second, um, there seems to be a wide range of practice and which devices to use when. Um, so hopefully that will provide some fodder for your talk. Uh, as you can see from the results, um, 66 patient, 66 percent of uh, respondents are using intraatic balloon pumps as their first go-to. Six are using ECMO, and 28 percent are using Impella. Um, and with that, uh, we'll talk about that after your talk, and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, great. Can you hear me, Adam? I can. Can you hear okay, all of great. us, Dr. Kapoor? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Great. Well, thanks so much uh, for uh, having me join you guys today. It's a really uh, fascinating discussion, as always, every time we talk about cardiogenic shock. Uh, so I was asked to talk about cath lab devices for shock in the setting of AMI or heart failure. So I think it's become pretty clear that shock is not um, something that's a static uh, entity. It's a pretty dynamic uh, problem. Patients can come in in variable conditions. That's where the Scott stages has come about. And shock requires the ability to also respond dynamically to your patient, starting off with drugs, uh, going to intraatic balloon pump or to Impella, and then escalating support as needed to VA ECMO, and then various combinations of those devices, as well as different ways of managing VA ECMO. And as a result, there's a lot of disparity in terms of how uh, how centers are using these technologies, which technologies are available, uh, and the evidence base behind these technologies is also, as we just talked about, is still very much in development. But I think one of the important things is the migration from surgical to percutaneous or endovascular delivery of devices for shock is driven by the need for speed as well as safety, trying to get these patients supported as quickly as possible uh, and in a safe manner. Now, I think it's also really important that a fundamental fact that we're uh, hopefully making very clear in the shock space is that not all shock is the same. Acute MI, cardiogenic shock, is a very different entity than heart failure, cardiogenic shock. And this paper that's coming out in the Journal of Cardiac Failure from our group is illustrating that in AMI, there's a sentinel event, which is a STEMI, 
And this leads to usually very profound hypotension, which can then subsequently lead to hypoperfusion and then ultimately congestion if you're not treated in a rapid manner. A lot of patients come in with LVDPs in the range of 15 up to 40, depending on how long they've been in their AMI shock condition. But for heart failure shock, it's different. Patients walking around with heart failure, they usually become congested and then develop hypoperfusion because of a low output state. But because of chronic norhormonal activation, they may not become hypotensive. And so how many of those low output indexes of 1.3, 1.4 with a wedge of 40 and an RA of 30, are they actually in shock? Most likely they are. And then they end with hypotension. So two very different directions for AMI and shock. And I think that's where the classification schemes have also started to evolve. And that's where the question of whether sky stages with more granularity as opposed to the semi-quantitative, semi-qualitative approach could be applied to AMI as well as to heart failure. And you know, Dan showed some really nice data from our group about congestive profiling, suggesting that congestion is really a target of therapy that we also have to pay attention to with these shock patients. And this goes all the way back to the Forrester Diamond Swan classification in 1977, basically demonstrating that there are two primary variables you have to keep in mind with AMI shock. One is low cardiac output, and the other one is elevated cardiac filling pressures. But even just elevated cardiac filling pressures in the setting of a cardiac index greater than two, already your mortality triples from three to 9%. As soon as you add a low cardiac output on top of congestion, now your mortality is around 51%. And that's where we are 40 years later in this space, is still dealing with AMI shock outcomes around 50%. So if a patient's hypotensive in AMI shock, support the patient. If you're unsure about the hemodynamic status, our recommendation is to check an LVDP or a wedge, and then also collect the cardiac index once you have that capacity. But I think it's really important to recognize that we can learn a lot from our surgical colleagues in the cath lab, as we've done for decades. And it's important to recognize that if an AMI shock patient comes in to the operating room, the first step is to support the patient hemodynamically unload or rest the heart, and then revascularize the patient. And I think interventionalists should also start to think about their management of AMI shock as going on pump. I don't think we would ask our surgeons to do an AMI shock case and revascularize off pump. So there's no reason in the contemporary era that interventionalists should be held to a different metric where the patient's not hemodynamically supported, and now we're being asked to do revascularization for AMI shock. But let's look at the technology. So for balloon pump with AMI cardiogenic shock, the landmark trial is the IABP shock two study. Is randomized patients to balloon pump or no balloon pump? And the p-value was non-significant between those two arms. But the devil's in the details around IABP shock two. There was indiscriminate use of IABP. There was no timing aspect. There was no evaluation of the patient with hemodynamic or metabolic parameters. There was also no use of PA catheter. And we didn't actually show that the balloon pump was actually being used effectively. You know that looking at counterpulsation requires a little bit more scrutiny of whether or not you're getting systolic unloading and are you actually getting that diastolic augmentation. And some sub analyses from the IBP shock 2 study, like the one on the right, shows that if you implant the IBP before PCI and AMI shock, you actually do get better outcomes. So I think it's important to recognize that indiscriminate use of balloon pump an AMI shock, which means STEMI and non-STEMI, lacks benefit. But the question is, is there a need for IABP shock three, which would more carefully select patients and target pre-PCI intraortic balloon pump? Now, what about um, intraortic balloon pumps in AMI without cardiogenic shock? So the CRISP AMI trial also showed no benefit of pre-reperfusion IABP in anterior AMI without cardiogenic shock in terms of infarctized or myocardial um, salvage. And so these are other pieces of data that may be driving the poll discrimination that you just showed with IABP versus other technologies. Now, what about the case of Impella? So this was one of the earliest studies from Bill O'Neill indicating that Impella 2.5, given pre-PCI, seemed to have better survivorship compared to post-PCI Impella in AMI shock. So even in these early stages, 2013, the timing interval of hemodynamic support in AMI shock starts to become very clear. And so that's that idea of perhaps we should go on pump and then revascularize as AMI shock. And maybe what pump you use is less, is less of a critical issue. Now the NCSI data I think has really helped move the field forward, a prospective single arm registry, uh, of putting an algorithm of early impella use in the AMI shock setting. 
And what you can see is compared to the other trials in this space, shock, IABP shock, culprit shock, where survivorship still hits around those 1977 numbers, 50 to 60% uh, mortality, what you're seeing now is with NCSI, you're around 70% survival. So does this tell us that even in shock patients, it's not just about the pump itself, it's also about the timing, having an algorithm to manage the patient, I think is what's changing the paradigm going forward. It's also important to note that in this spirit of devices and what they do to uh, the myocardium, we're beginning to realize that mechanical unloading before reperfusion, it's not just about hemodynamic support. There's actually a lot of data showing that unloading before reperfusion drives cardioprotective reprogramming of the left ventricle. There are thousands of genes and metabolites that are altered as soon as you're in an unloaded state. When's the last time you actually did a bypass on an LVAD patient? Or when did you do a PCI on an LVAD patient? Once they're unloaded, ischemia is not an issue. So I think this has been a real interesting area of uh, discovery for us over the past few decades, looking at mechanical unloading as an approach to improve myocardial recovery in AMI. And this also is very relevant for the AMI shock space. And what we've learned is that biologically, once the heart is resting, there's a significant amount of mitoprotection of those mitochondria, which are so important for myocardial salvage and myocardial recovery. And this is what led to the door to unload pilot study, where we looked at unloading plus immediate versus delayed reperfusion, essentially going on pump and then taking your time to get that revascularization done. And you can see compared to CRISP AMI, the 30 day infarct size is shown on the left with active unloading, there seems to be a reduction in infarct size compared to historic controls. And then even between the two arms of the pilot, with delayed re reperfusion after unloading, there was a statistically significant lower infarct size, especially in the largest MIs, ST sum greater than six millimeters. And this is what's led to the STEMI DTU pivotal trial, which now is enrolling patients with anterior MI to Impella before PCI versus primary PCI alone. And this is important to recognize. Imagine a space where you could actually reduce the amount of myocardial damage and actually get less post-infarct, post-MI heart failure. And that's what we're seeing in the semi d 2 experience from the pilot is that this primary reperfusion arm versus primary unloading, within days, we're seeing myocardium recover. And this has huge implications for the trajectory of these patients with their heart failure. Now, what about VA ECMO in acute MI and cardiogenic shock? It's important to recognize that VA ECMO is becoming an interventional cardiology domain. There's been an 11-fold increase in the use of VA ECMO in acute MI in the United States for AMI shock. We're also seeing that this is beginning to now change the practice pattern where interventionalists are now beginning to use VA ECMO more commonly as an upfront strategy compared to other technologies. The ARREST trial that was published earlier this year is probably one of the most important studies that's beginning to push forward this concept of early ECMO use. It's the first study reporting feasibility of a door to ECMO time in the cath lab. And this is in the setting of out of hospital cardiac arrest. In this small study, the ECMO facilitated resuscitation arm shown on the left actually had a significant number of those patients get primary reperfusion, 13 out of 15. And you can now start to see door to ECMO shown here, time from 911 to ECMO initiation. Also cath lab arrival to ECMO initiation is now occurring, occurring on the order of less than 10 minutes. So this also is beginning to change the paradigm of how we manage AMI shock in the cath lab the entrance of VA ECMO. Now, this is also being studied in a randomized study. This is also from Holger Thiele, who ran IVP shock 2, basically randomizing patients to VA ECMO or no VA ECMO in AMI shock. And so the question is, is this rigor of this trial design sufficient to show benefit of a technology versus simply p-value of NS? So I think to advance the field, it's pretty clear we need more randomized controlled trials in the space. In Recover 4, which is now in development, the idea is not to simply pit device against no device or one device versus another device. It's actually to test an algorithm versus another algorithm. A lot of centers use balloon pump for AMI shock. And the question is, what are they doing in their algorithms to manage these patients? And how can those be improved to best practices? And the same with the Impella arm. How are those best practices? And when we put those two side by side, we're now comparing algorithm to algorithm. Now, to, for the last few minutes, I'll just talk about acutely decompensated heart failure and shock. As we talked about, this is a very different clinical trajectory from congestion to hypoperfusion to then ultimately to hypotension with a lot of biventricular involvement 
in these chronic heart failure patients. From the shock working group, we saw that there's significant heterogeneity of acute mechanical support devices that are used for cardiogenic shock. There's still a substantial amount of balloon pump use in the United States. And there's also a lot of patients who don't get mechanical support. As you go from sky stage B to sky stage E, the amount of biventricular support also starts to increase in its frequency, suggesting again, more, uh, more sicker patients with biventricular involvement. More specifically in the uh, heart failure population with cardiogenic shock, the impact of your technology and the frequency of the technology being used is different. Whether you go to native heart survival, cardiac replacement, or if you have mortality. And you can start to see, for example, balloon pump in the blue starts to have a significant utilization, especially amongst patients who are going for replacement. And there's a lot of potential reasons for that, but clearly IVP in advanced heart failure is part and parcel of our management strategies across the United States. So why do we use balloon pumps in heart failure and shock? And the main reason is that afterload reduction plays a key role in advanced heart failure reduced DF patients. And this is a nice illustration of this from Barry Borlaug, showing that if you drop your uh, systolic pressure by 18 millimeters of mercury, you get a substantial increase in your stroke volume by 23 cc's per cardiac cycle. And that tells you that load dependence is something we shouldn't ignore in advanced heart failure patients that can be managed with a balloon pump. So why do we use Impella in heart failure and shock? And the thing here is that in this illustration, we're showing that active LV unloading actually can improve biventricular efficiency. What we're seeing is the Impella 55 being activated and you get 4.8 liters per minute. In the upper left, we're seeing that there's minimal pulsatility, there's nice unloading effect. And you can also see that the RV, as soon as you go on 55, is a significant reduction in the RVSP and also minimal pulsatility in the arterial tracing. And on the pressure volume loops, we see that with Impella 55 activation, there's a reduction immediately within pressure volume area. And we also see that the RV has a very different response. We go back to that nice triangular unloaded, uh, highly compliant right ventricle uh, as compared to when you're loaded with high filling pressures on the left side. And why do we use VA ECMO in advanced heart failure shock? It's important to recognize that we don't use this for LV unloading. We use this primarily for hemometabolic shock to provide systemic perfusion. And both Dan Burkhoff and Mark Dickstein have shown some really excellent in silico models explaining why you might see LV distension with VA ECMO. Usually it's in the heart failure population, low EF, low MAP, high LVDP or wedge pressure. And our understanding of VA ECMO remains significantly limited. We're beginning to see data suggesting benefit potentially of VA ECMO with unloading. This is the ACPELA data on the left, also in the middle from the European experience showing better outcomes. But we also see data suggesting that ECMO with a balloon pump has similar hemodynamic effects with ECMO and a PVAD. So I think right now there are a number of unanswered questions, but from a, a technical operator perspective, the amount of French sizes that we're beginning to apply when we go from VA to ECPELA to now adding VAV or VAA or VVA, these combinations start to increase risk. And that's something that we have to bear in mind when we look at the common denominator of survivorship, which is vascular safety. So I think it's safe to say that we need distinct algorithms, we need distinct randomized controlled trials, and we also need distinct management programs for cardiogenic shock due to acute MI as compared to heart failure. And the use of cath lab devices is only gonna grow in this space. And I think it's something we need to pay close attention to. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kapoor. That was a, a great talk. Um, I really found uh, your um, uh, treatment of the unloading and the impact of that in, in our timing of how we deal with these AMI patients to you know, uh, be fascinating, have some real implications. I know we're running a little bit on time here, so why don't we queue up our next poll while we um, continue to talk a little bit. Um, the, the, one of the questions I had from our um, uh, uh, review of your slides was uh, how you really help decide, you saw in the poll there's wide variance, 30% of people use Impella uh, as their go-to device right from the very beginning. And there's compelling data for it uh, when you look at the, the pressure volume loops, but yet, you know, uh, so over 60% are still using uh, intraortic balloon pumps as their go-to. How do you kind of parse these patients out 
um, to try and identify the groups that are going to ben benefit the most from, from each specific device. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'll, I'll be brief here just for a limit of time. But on the heart failure side, it's a very different algorithm for decision making around balloon pump, impella, or ECMO than on the AMI side. On the AMI side, what I'm interested in doing is less about choosing the device. It's more about what are my clinical targets for this patient. A profoundly hypotensive patient with AMI shock coming in is going to need circulatory support, systemic perfusion, and ventricular unloading. And that may require something more robust uh, as opposed to a patient who comes in with an early stage of uh, AMI shock where there's still marginal hypotension and you really just need to get the patient some sort of support. The data is still open and we still have to do the trial. The molecular data that I showed you is compelling though for the impact of LV unloading and its biologic effect. And I think that's where we start to see some shifts. But certainly for folks who don't have Impella and are using balloon pump, I think you're squarely within reason to use a balloon pump. If you need to escalate, then VA ECMO is sort of your next step. And I think physicians need more guidance. And that's our job on the clinical uh, side is to generate that much needed data uh, to help physicians with uh, device selection. Great, okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna move along. Uh, thank you for participating in our uh, last poll, uh, which was my institution uses a shock team in the management of cardiogenic shock patients. 36% uh, uh, do use that at their respective institutions and 64% do not. Um, and with that, uh, we'll move along to uh, Dr. Lior Yarbrough from the University of Virginia, who is going to talk to us about uh, surgical devices uh, in the management uh, and, and strategizing of cardiogenic shock, uh, including ECMO. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Am I sharing the right sl slide here? <laughs> you see him okay? I think so. It looks great to me. Perfect. Um, I'm happy I'm going last and that there's not much time because I only prepared a couple slides here, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity here. I'm gonna be talking um, about the surgical management of shock um, and how, uh, when I get called, what sorts of things uh, I think about. So as we all know, in the management of shock, we've discussed it, timing is everything. Um, and this is particularly true in cardiogenic shock, of course, uh, where there's pump failure. And so um, we, like other centers, have developed an algorithm around this, uh, including a team um, where we're able to mobilize the cardiologists, the advanced heart failure doctors, uh, and the surgeons and the ICU team all with a single phone call. And really anybody in the hospital can initiate this just based on uh, clinical findings alone. Um, and we're, we're quickly mobilized and then together we form a plan. So just from my perspective or the surgeon's perspective, you know, the amount of uh, information that I'm able to gather on any given patient just basically depends on the acuity of the situation at hand. So um, a common scenario, or not super frequent, but one where I might not have a lot of time is uh, if a patient um, is undergoing CPR and they're calling me for ECMO. And so um, usually when I, these are the things here that I have listed uh, in terms of what I might wanna know, but depending on the acuity, uh, really I'm looking for contraindications to initiating support. You know, my goal is gonna be able to get that patient on, uh, on ECMO as fast as possible, but, uh, but are there, uh, can I anticoagulate them? Are there coexisting medical conditions that I need to know about? And then um, once we establish access, we can go backwards from there. But you know, the majority of people are actually uh, gonna be people with acute on chronic heart failure, maybe you're having being called to the cath lab to have a discussion about some advanced therapies and what the right strategy is gonna be. And so I think etiology um, and chronicity uh, is really important in understanding what the next best therapy is gonna be. Is it gonna be an impellus type support? Can a balloon pump suffice? Um, and so, or, or do we need ECMO? Um, we talked about some of the different options already uh, in terms of what we have. And, uh, you know, I think deciding is left-sided support versus right-sided support alone, um, probably one of the most sort of decision, uh, important decisions to make. Uh, do you need an oxygenator for this patient? Um, and then, you know, where is the patient? Can they transport? And I think this is really gonna be hospital specific uh, and it might be even time of day, uh, some, some services may be available versus not. And then you need to know a little bit more about the heart itself. Um, is there any intracardiac thrombus, aortic insufficiency? Do they have any prior surgery or mechanical aortic valve, which may prohibit some of these percutaneous techniques? And, and what's your expectation for that patient as they uh, go forward? Do you think that this is acute? They're gonna recover and just need temporary support. 
uh, you know, after you revascularize them, they should be all set. Or is this acute on chronic and they're really going down a, a transplant pathway? So those sorts of things are important to know upfront as best you can um, uh, when, you're, when you're walking into a situation like this. And um, so I think the best way to, to go over this is just maybe give a couple case examples of how uh, people who come in, and then we can have a discussion about what y'all will do. So this uh, first patient here is a 59-year-old who presented um, to a local hospital. He was in neuric and cardiogenic shock. He had a large, long history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. He was stabilized there, um, placed on CRT, and then referred to our transplant center. So uh, his EF was 15%. Again, this is chronic, uh, severely dilated LV. He had moderate RV dysfunction, uh, and he's still, still hypotensive on melanoma. So I could have a conversation with him. He's able to say, yes, I want everything, uh, but he was real sick and got sicker over the next 24 hours. We initiated uh, our transplant evaluation, but he uh, rapidly declined, uh, ultimately needing more mechanical support. And unfortunately he had uh, gram positive coxi growing from his catheter. And so after some discussion, we elected just to do a temporary femoral uh, uh, support with an impella and just do antibiotic therapy for, to stabilize him. And he did stabilize after 72 hours, I was able to take him for a surgical intervention uh, which uh, ultimately uh, decided to do a right axillary uh, to LV centromag. Uh, or the other way around. So basically a small anterior thoracotomy uh, to drain the LV and then uh, return through the right axillary artery. And, um, you know, with that configuration, he was able to be extubated, ambulate. Um, we can have further discussion about his wishes, complete his transplant workup. And so he's currently listed right now for a heart kidney. And I'd be curious to hear, you know, how everybody wants to, would manage a patient like this when, if we have a little bit of time for discussion here at the end. The other case, I think, to, to highlight some of the um, different surgical techniques that we have for, for cardiogenic shock um, is the second one, who's a 73-year-old female. She was transferred in. She had a late presentation MI and a, a ventricular septal rupture. She had a balloon pump placed prior to transfer over, um, but she did have just significant RV dysfunction, this non-restrictive apical BSD. And so, you know, they managed her as best we could uh, medically, you know, with the goal to allow her to become a little bit more fibrotic in that septum, but uh, she was declining pretty rapidly uh, with uh, advanced renal failure. And so um, we, so again, here, I wonder what people would do. You, you advance for mechanical support uh, or go to the operating room. And um, I elected to take her to the OR uh, then uh, for a, a VSD repair. And this is sort of her timeline. I knew coming out that, you know, I knew going in that we were going to need to be on mechanical support for a period of time. So uh, repaired a VSD, uh, rested her on central ECMO for 48 hours, um, after which we went back to the operating room to place an RVAD. So this was a right IJ to a tunnel PA graft out the um, third interspace. Uh, and then she basically had both ECMO and the RVAD running uh, simultaneously as we did a slow ECMO wean. Um, and we're able to wing her off of ECMO, close her chest and extubate her. And then it took another couple of days for her RV to really come around, but ultimately we decannulated her um, post op day nine for, from her BSD closure and just do that at the bedside under some local. So, you know, I think that cardiogenic shock can happen in all stages. And this is just an example of sort of a mechanical reason for it um, and some different options. And then, um, you know, it's just sort of overall, I know we're short on time here. so. The rapid assessment um, and treatment of cardiogenic shock is, uh, is really critical. And this, uh, this is from a surgical standpoint, um, as well as a, from cardiology standpoint, as was already mentioned. And so I think having a team approach uh, is essential. Um, look for the contraindications to advanced support. Um, but and I favor personally early corrective surgery if it's going to be a mechanical etiology for cardiogenic shock, acute AI, uh, MR, BSD. And, um, and then I think it's really important to match the level of support to the needs of the patient um, and then be prepared to change that configuration as the patient's needs change. So you may be either um, supporting them with uh, very little upfront and then they decline, or I would, I would argue maybe support them maximally upfront and then uh, peel away uh, different support as necessary. Um, I do prefer to uh, vent the LV for patients on ECMO, but I don't think it's essential for all patients. So you really do have to have the hemodynamic monitoring that we talked about in order to make that decision wisely. And, um, and for these patients, I think it's very important to configure them in a way where they can be up and ambulatory that just increases their chances of moving on to the next step, whether it's a durable LVAD or transplant. And even if it's gonna be recovery, 
um, you're, you're trying to avoid all of those uh, potential complications of vascular limb uh, complications, but also pneumonia. Um, and the more people can be up and talking, the safer they are, uh, no matter where you are. So that's what I have for today. And uh, hopefully this will be some uh, time for discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Yarborough. Um, you know, one of the, one of the questions that, uh, that, that I have in light of uh, your case reports and uh, certainly in some of the other talks uh, about the benefits of unloading, um, you have these, you know, you have a sick patient, obviously, that's come in after a significant MI. Um, how, you know, what is your approach to establishing viability and timing in these patients? And how does that play in to your timing uh, of um, surgical intervention? Um, I know you had kind of alluded to it in your, in your first case report. Do you have any specific strategies you use for helping determine your timing to the operating room? Yeah, so I think it depends on what they need. If it's a time to uh, revascularization for um, cabbage or something like that, then uh, I think you can unload and wait. Um, you know, we have, if people have a V-fib arrest, for instance, outside, but then you have ROS when they come back in and those are supported with a balloon pump. I think that there is benefit and safety uh, for waiting until that inflammatory um, uh, sort of stage passes, you know, whether that's 48 or 72 hours. Um, that also usually gives the Berlinta or whatever it, <laughs> they've been loaded with a little time to wash out. Um, but, uh, but that's the only real instance in which I think that it's a beneficial to wait. Now, maybe this is just, I'd be curious to hear you guys' personalities, but, uh, you know, when people are in shock, they really need, their organs need blood. And, and um, I think that early initiation of ECMO for even if it's perfusion of the other organs, even if you're not going to save the heart itself, um, is really, really important. Uh, and the, the way we can make a difference is to uh, feed people to the hospitals and to the centers that know how to um, uh, can have the resources really uh, to make sure that that can happen. So, Yeah, you know, and I'll be interested to see uh, at this point, guys, I know that we're kind of at the end of the hour, but uh, I would like to invite everybody to stay on for um, a few minutes of group discussion because I'll be really interested to bring the rest of the panel in and, and get some crosstalk here um, uh, on these topics. And, and at this point, I wanted to um, cue in uh, Dr. CJ, who's been running the chat box uh, for us and been doing our web moderation and see if there are any kind of hot button topics uh, from the audience and we'll open it up to the entire panel. Uh, and, then, and then we can kind of discuss some 30,000 foot view questions. Okay, I, uh, I, I'll, I, I'm happy to get this kicked off. So I yeah, think yeah, go one, ahead, one, um, one interesting discussion in the chat box while we're getting queued up is between Dr. Perky, Dr. Laforte and, and Dr. Khan. And it essentially centers around how often is it availability of a specific device that drives the decision to use that device as opposed to this is the best device, meaning balloon pumps are readily available in most cath labs. Um, impella may not be, ECMO is certainly usually a more coordinary form. And you know, how often do, do we settle for a device we have as opposed to the best device the patient would benefit from? I, I think it's probably pretty common, Claudius. I think the, um, this is one of the challenges in the space right now is you know, we've got a lot of devices out there. We've got heterogeneity and availability of these resources. Uh, some are some are more resource intensive than others. Um, you know, Impella also requires a bit more education and a little bit more, uh, you know, technical applicability compared to balloon pump. VA ECMO requires a team uh, and significant, you know, resource allocation. Um, you know, it also makes it very challenging to do trials because uh, you can't really have all centers participating. They don't have the technologies, you know, actually available to them. Uh, so I think that's why at this stage it's important for folks to understand what are the fundamental principles of management and how do you get to those management? It's like a Rubik's cube. You can, you can come up with all sorts of different combinations, but as long as you're achieving the same targets uh, of therapy, then I think you, you, people are guided in the current era until we have more data. And to uh, Leora's point about you know, making sure we get end organ systemic perfusion, this is absolutely correct, especially for patients who have evidence of profound systemic hypoperfusion. I would just add in though, 
that we don't want to sacrifice the myocardium. You know, a lot of the end-stage dilated cardiomyopathy patients, I think there's, you know, as long as they have an exit strategy, it's a bit different. But in AMI patients, that's where, you know, getting a cardiac unloading strategy combined with adequate systemic perfusion might get us a chance to recovery as opposed to bridging to um, bad or transplant. Um, but yeah, the heterogeneity of resource allocation is, is a big problem, uh, but it's driven by lack of data, is, is my perspective. Yeah, it's sort of the call from, let's say, our colleagues in Alaska saying, we know our patient should be on ECMO, but all we have is a balloon pump. So here we go. Yeah. yeah Another really thing I have is uh, uh, to Dr. Kapoor and Dr. Yarborough, uh, after the presentation, excellent presentations, uh, what is the uh, timing for revascularization for these acute MI patients? after uh, you talk on unloading first versus reperfusion, which is, which is shown to have better outcomes, what do you think is the right strategy or when do you think we should reperfuse? Yeah, from you want to go first? Uh... Sure, I mean, I think that um, if you're appropriately unloaded, I guess uh, the reason for it, and if the scheme is ongoing, then I think you have to correct that. But if you're unloaded and your, your heart is no longer in, under threat, then you do have to factor in some of the other things um, like anticoagulation, just speaking from a surgical perspective, like anticoagulation, et cetera. I think it's probably different if you're in the cath lab and going to treat them percutaneously. Um, so if you have bought yourself enough time to look at their, their disease and they, they have three vessel disease or such, and you have to go that way, um, then, then I'd say waiting, um, it still has the better outcomes, at least as well as we know, but um, I'll let you speak to the, the cardiology intervention in terms of percutaneous. Yeah, and I, you know, I think, again, that's where we learn from folks like Leora and the surgical approach. I think it's pretty clear to understand you know, three things. One is that if you have a profoundly hypotensive patient uh, who you can't support, you can't get a blood pressure, doing revascularization in that setting is really, really challenging. And I think there it's a little bit more clear that you need to get on support and then go ahead and do your revask. Um, I think it's also secondarily, it's important to recognize that in uh, the discussion, AMI without cardiogenic shock, I think the bottom line is you have to revascularize immediately. There's no reason to delay reperfusion in patients with AMI without cardiogenic shock. The trial that's ongoing is testing a hypothesis of LD unloading as a strategy to reduce infarct size and that, uh, that is ongoing. So get involved in the trial is what I would answer for that one. But for the third point, on patients who come in with AMI shock who are not profoundly hypotensive, but you have an, a large anterior wall or a large myocardium at risk, I think it's important at that point to tailor your approach. Um, if you're unsure about what the hemodynamic status of the patient is, collect some data. A pigtail LDEDP of 40 should be concerning in those patients with marginal blood pressures. Um, and so that might trigger you to put them on support and do the revask uh, if they're in shock. But you have to document somehow that the patient is in shock, and that'll at least give you some rationale for why you went on support before revask. But in the vast majority of cases right now, early revascularization, immediate revascularization is the standard of care um, until we have more data. Mm -hmm. cool. Um, and I, you know, at our center, I know we have a pretty low threshold for initiating preoperative support, just with the understanding that it's also going to help us uh, uh, post-surgically as, as well, uh, struggling to come off bypass a, a sick heart with a patient that was, you know, preoperatively in shock. Um, and uh, I, I know we're short on time, but I did want to get to this because several people have raised a question, you know, MCS is always a tale of uh, too much and never enough. Um, and, um, you know, as we've seen a lot of these new generation devices in Pella obviously has changed the game for a lot of centers. Um, how are we incorporating that into our ECMO paradigm in terms of LV venting, uh, and ECPELA, you know, we've seen a lot, uh, uh, of commentary about that. And I would be interested to, um, to hear y'all's practice and perspectives. Um, <laughs> I have mixed feelings. <laughs> um, I, one, I think that not everybody needs it. So um, I really think that the hemodynamic like monitoring, like I alluded to before, is important. Before you throw, you know, all these devices up people's uh, <laughs> femoral arteries, which are potentially diseased and, and everything else, you got to have a reason for it. 
So I think that's the first thing to say um, about this, the type of support that you use. So if, if VA ECMO, say we're on VA ECMO only femorally, and that's okay, then let it be okay. But you gotta be watching them. And I, I don't let a VA ECMO patient go more than six hours without an echo uh, and looking at their PA catheter numbers to know, am I okay? Um, or, or are they still not effectively unloaded? Um, and so, and if they're not, then my next thought is what's their outcome? So if they are somebody, and this is just a personal strategy, if there's somebody who's gonna be a non-recovery, uh, as in the instance of this uh, gentleman who came in, I know they're moving on to transplant, and I'll configure them something up top almost within the next day. So uh, LV venting for a centromag and then an axillary approach. So, that, so I'm, that's a whole different patient than somebody who I'm expecting to recover. And in the recovery patient, we'll usually put an impella in uh, or, or even use a balloon pump if they've already come to us with a balloon pump. We'll just leave it in place. And that, that usually is enough. Uh, and then just, you have to make sure you're drained on the venous side too. I think people underestimate um, the, the benefit to draining the, the venous side. So sometimes that's two venous cannulas, that's aggressive volume removal with CRT on the, you know, inside of the, the ECMO um, pump. So I think that um, drainage on the venous side can really help out. Dr. Kapoor, Dr. Burkhoff, did you guys have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think Leora hit it right on the head, and I, she basically just um, identified the three primary predictors of when you're going to need that vent, you know, really profound low EF, high congestive status, uh, you know, and somebody who's minimally pulsatile, uh, and who's hypotensive, where when you go on ECMO, you're going to raise that afterload substantially. Um, I will say that, you know, what we're learning in our translational lab and in our clinical labs is that there is a difference between LV venting and LV unloading. LV venting is really designed to reduce left heart filling pressures to prevent pulmonary congestion on ECMO, which can be profound in some cases. Um, LV unloading still refers to the reduction in pressure and volume in the native left ventricle. And you know how you achieve those can be done in several different ways. I do think that in patients who have profoundly high right-sided filling pressures, it's challenging for us clinically to get enough uh, preload reduction with VA ECMO to adequately unload the left ventricle. Even with a PA uh, cannula on top of an SVC cannula, it can be tough. And that's where I think if your goal is unloading, then that's where something like an impella or ECPELA strategy might be considered. And that is if you're trying to bridge to recovery um, for those patients. Often we decannulate ECMO and leave them on the impella um, to then continue recovery. But if your goal is uh, venting, then I think you know, there are about eight different ways you can do that uh, if it's just simply to reduce uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. My guess and my personal opinion is that unloading uh, will lead to better myocardial recovery and salvage. But if your goal is bridge to next therapy, uh, as in a lot of our um, advanced heart failure population, then the focus there is venting to make sure we don't have ongoing lung injury in the setting of VA ECMO as you uh, bridge to next therapy. Okay, great. Well. Um... You know, with that, we're about 15 minutes over. We could really talk all day. Um, I cannot thank our panelists enough. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter now for some closing uh, uh, comments and remarks. So we, uh, one, just want to thank uh, all the panelists and I say we've had a tremendous turnout. Uh, we could go on for another hour. I still was, was very interested as to uh, everyone's vote on Impella 2.5 CP and 5.0 or 5.5 is to win. So we'll have to have a whole nother meeting. But uh, we want to thank everybody. I say it's been a tremendous conversation. There's so much to learn. And uh, similarly is um, uh, it's been recorded. Uh, so for those people that would like, like access to re-review, uh, uh, Chris will come on in just a second. Uh, but we want to thank all our panelists. Uh, we know it's still in these times. Uh, even though it's called a webinar, it uh, takes a tremendous amount of time and effort out of your day. We really appreciate it. And I think uh, uh, we had a tremendous turnout with great panelists. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to CTS Net for allowing us to use their network. Uh, and uh, uh, Chris, if you want to announce how people could access the recording, that would be great. And we'll call it a day. But thank you all once again very much. And hey, thank you to you, Asio Journal, one more time. And if you want to find the recording of this webinar or the previous webinar between CTS Net and Asio Journal, you can look at ctsnet.org, that's ctsnet.org. And this one will be up probably on Monday morning. So thank you. Great, thank you everyone again.
Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.